Okay, uh, today and Friday we shall look at the uh, emergence and history of uh, what we call sometimes the barbarian kingdoms. Uh, a series of states changing in composition uh, in many cases which emerge at the end of the Roman period and into the very early Middle Ages. So we're talking kind of roughly, in some cases, second half of the 5th century down to kind of into the 7th century or whatever, okay? And these kingdoms uh, we see as the kind of heirs or successors of what had been the uh, um, Roman Empire in Western Europe. Here is a map which shows the situation as it's kind of developing uh, in the 5th century and similar maps we've seen from I think probably both presenters last week so we'll just repeat ourselves very slightly but we have the border of the Roman Empire as it had been for quite a long time okay and in the Western Europe it's essentially the Rhine and the Danube which form that border and along that border in various places during the uh, fifth and into the sixth centuries, we see various groups that we call Germanic, and we had all our discussions about the language stuff last week, but we define them as Germanic peoples in one way or another, creeping in, sometimes being invited in as uh, warriors, as a kind of hired mercenaries, effectively, or whatever, and sometimes bursting in uh, across the border and causing uh, various degrees of uh, problems, changes, uh, political transformation and so on. And as one of the presenters mentioned last week, the English word vandal, which is used to mean someone who does destructive things uh, to someone else's property or whatever, uh, actually comes from the name of one of these groups that crept in uh, along here, went through France, went through what is now Spain, and ended up briefly having a kingdom in North Africa, about which we know very little and many documents survive from that. Okay, and. What is the Arabic name for Spain or the Iberian Peninsula? Do we know? What is the name for this area in Arabic? Andalusia, and al Andalus or something. Andalusia it's called, okay. And that is connected probably through the sort of Berber, the North African uh, people's uh, in interpretation of the Vandals because for them, these guys came from there and so on, okay. So Andalusia connected to there as well. So they've contributed to English, they've contributed to the one of the names for Spain. Uh, they're not very important for us today, however. Uh, in particular, today and in more detail on Friday, we shall be discussing firstly the Ostrogoths, as we heard, uh, a group of Germanic peoples, probably more of a confederation uh, up to a point. Uh, we can call them the Eastern Goths. Uh, in contrast to the Visigoths over here. So the Ostrogoths end up in what is Italy, the Visigoths end up in what is now Spain, Portugal and so on. And in, in addition we should be looking at the Franks who creep in here right in the uh, northern parts of what uh, was Gaul and end up creating the Frankish kingdom which eventually pushes the Visigoths and the Burgundians and creates basically what becomes France. The next week we shall be doing a similar study but looking at what goes on in the British Isles. Though this is meant to be a kind of Europe-wide course, so I don't look at uh, British or English history too much. We will do that occasionally. So we shall do continent today and then the uh, origins of the Anglo-Saxons and so on uh, next week. Similar issues. And then briefly this week we shall also look at this group, the Lombards, who end up kind of succeeding the Ostrogoths after a while uh, in uh, Italy as well, another group there. Okay, so that's the kind of pattern of movements and so on. We don't need to worry about uh, the finer details uh, too much here. Um, what we're probably going to do, because Ravel and I were talking uh, before, uh, he's, gonna, he's prepared or he's going to prepare something on the Ostrogothic kingdom, which is kind of vaguely what I was thinking of doing today. Uh, so um, we'll talk very, very generally today. We'll talk more general issues and matters. And then we shall look at Ostrogothic Italy, maybe a little bit about the Visigoths in Spain, and quite a lot about the uh, Franks in, uh, the Merovingian Franks in Gaul on Friday. So we'll look at the details on Friday. And all of you should uh, print out those two documents, 
the letters of Theodoric and Gregory of Tours uh, accounts of Clovis and be prepared to discuss those uh, at the last part of the class. Hopefully what Ravel will tell us about the Ostrogoths, what I will say about the Franks will help us to put uh, those two sets of documents into a kind of a context and I'll probably put some questions, I'll try and remember to put some questions on Moodle, some things for you to kind of think about that might help you uh, with that as well. Okay, so one of the big issues that we need to uh, stress and we talked about it on uh, in, during last week as well uh, is this idea of continuity or change and we used the word kind of transition or something uh, last week. Um, in many respects, what we see, perhaps we go to round about 600, so we have a different map here, but this is kind of uh, a simpler map. What we see here are a series of uh, kingdoms uh, ruled by people that we regard as Germanic barbarians, uh, okay, uh, dividing up what we see as the Western Roman Empire in a very different way. So, from one perspective, we see change. From one point of view, we see big change. Okay, this political map, very different from the map of Western Europe that we would see a few hundred years earlier when we see it as part of the uh, Roman world, as a single entity uh, ruled from somewhere in Italy at that point. So, on the one hand, we have... Uh, change. We have big change being marked uh, by this political map here. However, as I also said last week, for many of the uh, people who fig figure in our documents, for many of the people writing documents at that time, and we don't have a lot of them as I've said before, but for many of the people living in the uh, 6th century, for example, they didn't perceive it quite as black and white, as distinct as this, that we have Rome and then we have these uh, barbarian kingdoms appearing uh, during the 5th and into the 6th centuries or whatever. They, they saw themselves as the heirs, as providing some kind of continuity from the Roman world. And we see this in various ways. And that's one of the things I want you to think about when reading those documents for Friday. Okay? When reading the documents about Clovis, when reading the letters written by or on behalf of King Theodoric, think how are these guys behaving and in what ways are they feeling themselves or trying to provide some connection with the Roman past, okay? Because they certainly didn't think of themselves necessarily as complete outsiders and as barbarians. They saw themselves as representing some kind of continuity. And of course, how do we define Romanitas, Romanness or whatever? Uh, as I've said before, the Roman world, the Roman history uh, covering many hundreds of years was not a monolithic single thing, so we cannot actually say um, necessarily that we have change uh, or we have continuity, we have to understand each uh, period, but primarily we have to think um, what is going on here with the uh, shifting uh, perspectives and so on, what happens to Romanitas. How do we define Romanness then? Any ideas? If you want to define uh, Roman world or Romanitas, Romanness, uh, and to say that somehow it's been changed or gone, what things would we look at? How would we define the Roman world? Or if you picked someone and said, here is a Roman person, and we call him Roman because of this, this, and this. Any ideas? How would we define someone as being a Roman? At some point, yeah. how could we do that? Most probably, they define themselves as civilized. Right. Okay. Civilized. Okay. They certainly, many, many big empires, of course, saw themselves as civilized. We we went through the whole. It was Edgem, where actually defining the concepts of barbarian and what that means and so on. But uh, yeah, they would have seen themselves as somehow civilized, as most of the non-civilized others. Sorry. Settled, all right. Uh, oh, and we can put with that urban, did someone just say? Okay, right. Catholic. Catholic. Obviously, very, very early Romans were not Catholics, but the late Romans were, 
Uh, thanks, and we'll discuss the history of the church in a few weeks' time, thanks to Constantine the Great to a large extent. Uh, so Christian or Catholic uh, in the West, of course, uh, slightly different uh, Christianity in the uh, East, but Christian perhaps better here. Anything else? Citizens, okay. You, the, you could say people perceive themselves as formally or legally part of the Roman world, not just culturally so. And there was the concept of citizenship very, very important in the early Roman Empire, slightly differently uh, perceived or, or controlled later on, of course. Anything else? Uh, at least some kind of law. Right. right. Cool. What about language? Sure, okay. okay, well, yeah. Latin, obviously, a very important part of being Roman and so on. What were you saying? I said shared myth. These other people, like Ostrogoths or the other people, would have other myths. You know, we came from here, we came from, But the Romans had the definite uh, myth of themselves. Origin myth, identity, something like that, okay. You have an identity in the stories you tell, the ideas you have about yourselves as a community or something like that, okay. Yes. Anything else to add to this? Okay. Well, th this is a good... Right, y yes. Uh, uh, let's put Latin language literature together, okay architecture and all sorts of things, the way that they try and construct buildings. Or... Oh, hang on, we're not, we're not saying, we're not comparing at the moment, we're going to do that in a minute. First, we're just taking our Roman man, okay, and saying, okay, what things will, will we expect him or her, it would be sexist and say him, but what will we expect from this person? Okay, now we're not necessarily going to be guaranteeing all of these because, as I said, we can't uh, simplify things. But we're picking up a number of things that we might look for. Um, what? For the Romans, right, okay, in the early empire as well, I mean, the, the basis of the Roman Empire obviously was military conquest and uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, military spirit which uh, Romans had and so on. We, uh, well, how are we going to simplify this one? But uh, let's just put military there or something. Is that's obviously a very, very big thing. But yeah, when we think of Romans, we think of those legionnaires mar marching along with their skirts and with the funny hats and things like that or whatever. And early Romans at least, but the late Roman army was very different in a sense. Okay, so here's a kind of checklist of things. Now, we're not saying that every single Roman individual who would be defined uh, as a Roman citizen or whatever necessarily met all of these, and certainly didn't, we couldn't say every single person who was part of the Roman Empire would meet all of these criteria from the year, I don't know, 1 AD, AD 1, right down to uh, 450 or later or something, but it's a kind of rough guide uh, to issues and so on, that they had some kind of identity often given through the stories and their perceived origin, all societies have that. We've got the law, okay, that their society was, they believed, governed in some way by, by law. Um, they lived a largely urban and settled lifestyle. They were not moving around uh, following animals or whatever. And we can connect to that to this concept of civilized. Uh, after the time of Constantine, increasingly Roman people were also Christian of one sort or another. We have the concept of citizenship, which we could perhaps connect with law. Culturally speaking, they spoke Latin, they wrote in Latin, uh, they contributed or heard literature in Latin and so on, and they lived in buildings and designed in a certain way, and we've got the military idea here. So lots of stuff that we can kind of bunch together and say this is in one way or another Roman. If we take the kind of change perspective here, and say barbarian and Roman and somewhere around about the late 5th century things break down, then we would expect to see this list kind of disappearing, okay? That the people who succeed, the people that set up these kingdoms here and the way that they live their lives, the way they organize themselves, is somehow in stark contrast, very, very different to what we have in our list here. But as I hope we'll see today a little bit, and as I hope we'll see more detail on 
<coughs> Friday and then next week and throughout the course, okay, many of these things we actually uh, encounter uh, increasingly uh, in different combinations. So Romanitas will not disappear. Okay. Yeah, for instance, where that these new barbarian kids, they have kids who name themselves after Romans or name their kids the Roman names, something like that, so that they show a certain continuity. Let's postpone that question to a bit later because I've got another thing where I can look at names again and how we look at the peoples. But the names thing is, is very important. We did, I discussed it two weeks ago, onomastics and so on. And we'll come back to that. So, and if I come on to onomastics and I have a different focus, make sure you remind me of that particular question as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, n names is part of identity. We identify ourselves vaguely through the name. I talk about my name, David, is, comes from my Welshness in a sense, my Welsh my mother's Welsh origins and things like that. So it's part of my identity and people tend to give names uh, for cultural but also for other reasons, part of their group identity. So we'll come back to that one as well. Okay. Um, another question which we shall expand on shortly but just, just pick up on one of these, Latin. Okay. Um, okay, here is the kingdom of the Visigoths. Here's the kingdom of the Franks. Here are the, well, earlier the Ostrogoths, who we have here, the Lombards, okay. In this part of the world today, what do they speak? What do the common people, what do most people speak in this part of the world? Okay. Castilian Spanish or Catalan or Portuguese, whatever, okay. Iberian languages. What do people speak here mostly? French, and again, okay, you have the long dock, the long door, you have a bit of uh, uh, Catalan down here, and you have the things, but they're all largely also uh, what we call Romance languages. And obviously in Italy we have all sorts of different dialects which we classify as um, uh, Romance, Italian Romance as well. The Romance languages are just Latin in a simplified form, okay? So the people living today in those areas are speaking Latin in a sense in different forms and in the around about 600 to a large extent the people in those places continued to speak a uh, popular uh, or vulgar form of Latin okay so we don't see in these areas the disappearance of Latin and the arrival of Germanic the only exception to that is here where we do see eventually the disappearance of use of Celtic and Latin and its replacement by Germanic language, which is English. Okay? And that's the main strange exception, which we can talk about today, but mainly next week. Okay, so Latin, still there. Um, what do we know? Do we know anything about the religion of the Germanic peoples? What do we know about their religion? We can either refer to... Sorry? Originally, when they were outside of the Roman world, to a large extent, they were polytheistic, what we would call pagan peoples, worshipping many different gods. Okay? We know a little bit about their gods. Uh, we can make strong comparisons with the fuller information we have about the Viking gods, also Germanic peoples, and we can kind of say that perhaps it was similar or whatever. Okay. Um, but during the 5th and six centuries, most of the kings of the Germanic kingdoms, these barbarian kingdoms, became Christian, okay? Either Catholic Christian or Aryan Christian. Arianism was what becomes a heresy, a wrong interpretation, where they say, anyone know what Aryan heresy, anyone come across that before? Not with a Y, not uh, concepts of... Uh, 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 Arianism, we all know about Adolf Hitler and so on, but Arianism here, uh, Arius was a Christian thinker from the Roman period, who late Roman period, who believed or argued that uh, the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity were not equal, and that God the Father was somehow superior and separate from, a little bit separate from God the Son, Jesus, and things like that. Now in 
most Christian beliefs today uh, after the Council of Nicaea, where Arius' ideas were uh, condemned. Subsequently, okay, they have a different interpretation, the standard Catholic and Orthodox interpretations of this. But uh, at this time, things were a bit in flux, and we have people uh, ruling in these different kingdoms who were either Catholics or Arian Christians. Okay? So they became, to a large extent, Christian. Oh, we left that Catholic there, we should say. Christian, let's put that one in or whatever, okay. Um, to study these early kingdoms, we find that they wrote laws. We can study their societies by looking at the laws that they wrote down, okay. They wrote down laws. They began to write them down. Previously, they just had oral law, perhaps, as a way of organizing their society. Once they moved into Western Europe, they began to write things down and write down their laws about how to control people when they're fighting and so on and things like that. All right. So a number of these things already uh, fitting and coming into what we see. And in addition, even though clearly they have a certain identity as the uh, Franks or the Ostrogoths or whatever, when we look at the history of, or the histories of these people, and that moves me into the next sort of uh, image for you to see, um, we see a trend by a number of writers, themselves not necessarily Germanic people, uh, which are trying to fit these Germanic people into Roman and Christian history. They need to fit in. They're the bosses now. They're the rulers. They're the uh, patron of the society. And so we need to fit them into the existing historical framework, which is partly a Roman tradition and partly a Judeo-Christian tradition that they have in the Bible. So they're, they're fitting them into these things. Okay. So this brings me to this uh, uh, list here. For an historical approach to this period, in order to study uh, the history of these kingdoms during the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries, we are lucky enough to have a series of uh, books, accounts, histories, all rather different from one another, but which do give uh, some kind of chronological and narrative uh, to these kingdoms. Um, I won't say too much about all of them in detail, but it's worth mentioning them because they are very, very important. We have a few books about these in the library. For the Ostrogoths, we have a book written in the middle of the 6th century by a guy called Giordanes, uh, Getica, Gothica, okay, about the Goths, something like that. Okay. Sounds like the name of some kind of heavy metal band or something, but uh, uh, let's leave that out for the moment. Uh, this was probably, to a large extent, based upon the Gothic history written earlier in the same century by Cassiodorus. Cassiodorus was a Roman writer, intellectual. He was the secretary of Theodoric. So the guy who wrote the letters that you've either read or you will be reading soon, who wrote them down, probably was this guy. So he was a, a, a civilized Roman or whatever, Italian Roman, he, but he was connected to the court of these guys. And he wrote a history of his bosses. Okay, they came in, take over, and he writes their history, desperately trying to fit them in to the existing framework. We've lost that, but a little bit later, a similar thing is put down based largely upon his book. Okay. The danger with using, well, this, and by extension, especially this, is what? What would be the problem? What would you, the first thing you would think of, perhaps, before you start reading? I'm going to sit down and read this book, which is based on this one, and particularly with reference to this, I would, the first thing I would think of as an historian is, okay, careful, be careful, decat, because... Sorry? So there might be bias. Yes, in what kind of bias? Uh, that um, they'd be called barbarians. Because the writer is a Roman writer. Right. And uh, he would have the kind of feeling that... Um, uh, I don't know how to. Well, it would be it, it, the book would be biased towards his writing would be biased towards um, Romans or calling these people barbarians, uh, uh, uncivilized. Or yeah. Okay. Uh, but as I said, what? And there is a danger there. But what? This is this is a bit different. Cassiodorus was connected to the court, to the kingdom, to the ruler of 
Ostrogothic Italy, Theodoric, okay? He was the one that was his secretary. He was writing his things down. So, yes, whatever he thought, he may have thought all those things in his head. Uh, every day, having to work with this uncouth, drunken barbarian or something or whatever. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Theodoric on Friday in more detail. But his job was to write an official history, okay? Because he was writing it in connection with the king. So... Exactly. Okay, he's not. He's not going to write too many things in there, in which the king, uh, who he worked with, would be angry about. Okay. So there's a danger that this is going to be a little bit like political propaganda. Okay. It will. It will have their myths. It will have their stories. It's trying to integrate them. But we have to be careful that what Cassiodorus said, and therefore perhaps what Giordani's copied down later, uh, is kind of political propaganda. It's their official line. Because I'm the boss. They don't have TV, they don't have Facebook pages and things to impress people, but they do have an official history written by uh, at the court in that sense. Okay. Gregory of Tours, a little bit different, very important source, uh, one of the greatest kind of early medieval writers, in fact. He was a bishop of Tours, of a uh, uh, town in Tours, uh, from a, uh, a well-known uh, Roman or Gaulish Roman family or whatever. And towards the end of the 6th century, uh, he wrote something which we probably should call the Ten Books of History. Okay? Uh, it's usually called the History of the Franks, but he didn't call it that. And a lot of it isn't actually about the Franks. It's a history of, kind of Gaul and his region, and eventually, of course, the Franks come in because they're the big guys. Um, but he's, uh, he doesn't call it that. So the, uh, if you look at it elsewhere and see it called the history of the Franks or something, then that's kind of a little bit of a misnomer, a bit of a misleading thing. But a very, very translation in modern editions of a very, very thick book uh, which goes further back than the Frankish period, as I said, but very important source for the politics uh, of the time, uh, up to his own time. He tells stories that involve himself as well. He was a bishop, so he dealt with the kings uh, and so on at his own time. He also tells lots of stories, what we might call anecdotes, particularly in relation to uh, his own uh, city and elsewhere, okay, which give us a picture of the society and what life was like then and so on. He was a bishop. And there is an, a religious element to all this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on Friday when we look at his uh, depiction of uh, King Clovis, the sort of his superhero uh, for him is Clovis in that sense. Okay, so he also has a certain bias that's going on. Isidore of Seville, one of the great intellectuals of the uh, uh, very late Roman or early um, uh, post-Roman period, uh, okay, in what is now Spain, of course. Uh, wrote something which we usually call History of the Goths, Vandals, and Suaves. The Vandals we mentioned, Suaves are people who, uh, for a time, had uh, uh, the Germanic people who had uh, a kingdom up in what is now Galicia uh, in northwest uh, Iberia, and then eventually they get taken over by the Visigoths, of course. Okay. He's famous for writing something called Etymology. He's very uh, important evidence for the kind of intellectual traditions of the late Roman and early medieval periods as well. So he had various things going on. And then a bit later, uh, at the end of the 7th century, uh, Paul the Deacon uh, writes a kind of an official history of the Lombards as well and their activities in Italy. And as we shall discuss next week, uh, the Venerable Bede, uh, as he's usually called, okay, from uh, the early part of the 8th century in northern England, writes his account of the my mistake there, Esmer's ecclesiastical history. So it's not just a history of the Anglo-Saxons or the English people, uh, it's a religious history. So again, like all these writers who were uh, members of the, uh, to a large extent, members of the church of one sort or another, he was a monk uh, dotted in northern, in a monastery in northern England, but he was writing the history of his people from a religious perspective. So all of the big players in the sort of so-called barbarian period have their own kind of official historian or semi-official historian, as in the case of Gregory of Tours, which we can use, but we have to be careful of this, okay? And as I said, it's specifically stated, I think, in the case of Cassiodorus, that he was trying to fit in his masters, his bosses, 
into the existing framework. Okay, the world has changed. Politically, we don't have an emperor. We now have a small part of the empire ruled by this particular barbarian king, Germanic king, we might call him or whatever. So we better kind of somehow write an official account to make them fit in with what we, we understand of the history of the past so far. So this is to some extent what some of these writers are explicitly trying to do. So we have to uh, uh, understand that point. It's very important. Okay, so even origin and ID there, identity, is being kind of taken over by the Germanic peoples. The Roman world was uh, more heavily urbanized when you went further south and a little bit further east. Okay? When we move northwards and westwards, we see fewer and fewer cities, and we're dealing with the western regions here. But certainly many, many cities disappeared. They didn't have the infrastructure politically and economically to maintain large cities uh, throughout the uh, Western Europe in the 6th and 7th centuries. So it's certainly the case in Britain that we see the disappearance of big cities. But not all cities disappeared. Particularly on the Mediterranean, we see urban continuity as well. So these kingdoms did include urban centers, and they were largely settled and so on. But the way that they interacted was different. So we could do a kind of half tick there, I suppose. Citizenship, OK, well, um, Roman, Romanitas and legally the Roman concept disappears gradually. But as I said, even in the 6th century, OK, in, in uh, uh, western parts of Britain, right up in the north of the old Roman world, we see one writer, as I mentioned last week, uh, Gildas, this uh, important historian for early British history, uh, referring to himself and his fellow Britons as citizens. Okay? So he still somehow thinks of themselves as Roman and as Roman citizens. So that concept, uh, to some extent, continuing. So in different combinations, all of these things, or most of these criteria that we set out before as saying, this is how we might define uh, the Romanitas of this person, uh, continue. They may not be perfect. Perfect. They may not be using the best Latin uh, uh, compared to Julius Caesar or Cicero or something like that. Okay, The buildings and the towns they lived in may have been smaller and rather differently uh, uh, planned and so on. Okay, uh, They were coming up with a slightly different interpretation of Christianity and so on, but that builds upon what was going before. But to a large extent, okay, we see some or all of these things continuing. So again, this problem, do we really see it as a big change just because the political map changes or do we have to see sort of transition and gradual change or even uh, to a large extent continuity? <coughs> okay, um, can you can? Well, that's the question. That's what I've been trying to make us think about. And I'm not going to even say I'm necessarily giving an answer to that. Because, as I said, these are the questions that people, I hope, will be still debating in 100, 200 years' time. But uh, traditionally, we've always seen it as a matter of kind of Roman Empire disappears and a different world, a medieval world, appears and so on. And that's certainly the kind of way that, for example, people in the Renaissance wanted us to think about the Middle Ages as this dark period in between themselves and the Roman light. But I've been saying that it was a lot more complicated than that. The Roman world was changing and also the new world, whatever it is, of the 6th century was in many ways just a continuity of certain things from the late Roman Empire. So yes, I don't think we can necessarily say the Roman Empire collapsed. It may have changed. It just continued with different people in charge. I mean, how we have... And yeah, that's very important, okay? The economy was localizing. Uh, politically, we don't have a single ruler. So the political map with various kingdoms in it is just a political version of that localization. Perhaps that's something that. Now, Alp's looking kind of puzzled or whatever, so go on. Yeah, but I'm thinking that um, all these examples will continue. continues is Roman culture, Roman traditions. But then these barbarians, so-called barbarians, actually go under drastic change when they become Romanized. So we have to be careful with the way we pose the question. Am, am I making sense? From the perspective of the barbarians, right, they are new players. The political map has changed. And we're asking whether, in, in spite of this political change, in spite of the change in this political map, whether there is continuity, whether the Romans kind of, in a way, with their tradition, their culture, that they kind of merge into what then becomes the Middle Ages. Now, there are examples to this, yes. You know, um, 
what point they uh, religion, language, but all of these are examples of how drastic a change these barbarians went through. Their languages changed, their religion changed, and I presume Well, we're not looking at the, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. We're not, we're looking at the Roman side of the coin. We're not looking at the Germanic side of the coin. I mean, at the end, what we end up with is a hybrid, is a mixture of the two, but uh, you might see it as a, as a kind of barbarized form of the Roman world, or you might see it as a kind of Romanized form of the barbarian thing. There are continuity points from both sides. So we don't say that kind of the Roman, the Germanic peoples come in, step over the border, and then start wearing togas and becoming kind of civilized and things like that. Uh, or, I mean, obviously that's a, a being playing for the joke there, but um, uh, there are points of continuity and points of change. I'm not denying there wasn't change but then change was going on all the time. And if we look at it from the perspective of the, of the Germanic people, then they were adopting gradually at different stages, things like Christianity and Latin and, and so on. Okay, so that also provides, that provides change for them. But we were looking at it from the Roman perspective. We were ju judging it from the other side of the coin, primarily. We'll come to the Germanic bit now and on Friday, I think. Ravel? Uh, you were saying earlier that the people in the, in the Renaissance period wanted to distance themselves from the Middle Ages and like wanted to create this like a uh, the idea of like a, a drastic change between the two, uh, between like before and after the fall of the Roman Empire. What is it specifically about that time period that they wanted to distance themselves from? And what did they want to say like that they were closer to the Romans? All right, well, that, okay, let's, again, I don't want to keep saying, postpone that question till late. It was something that if we'd had time in the first week, I wanted to address, the concept of medium ivum, the Middle Ages, okay? And in many kind of people's perspective, we have the great civilized, we've got the word civilized over there already, Roman civilized world, and then somehow the Middle Ages is this kind of decline. Now that's probably how in a lot of Turkish schools it's seen, as the Middle Ages as some kind of a dark age or something like that, okay? Now as a medievalist, of course, naturally I don't want to see it quite like that, but that's uh, another point of view. But this is, to some extent, what was going on in Italy in the kind of late 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, okay? They were going through a cultural revival that we talk about as the Renaissance, which had a number of issues, and we should look at that in the final uh, topic of the course. And they looked around themselves, and they felt that they wanted to build up a connection, perhaps, with their, with their Roman ancestors. So they were in Italy, that's where Rome began, and so on. So they looked at the handwriting uh, that other parts of Europe had been using. They came up with a different handwriting, which they thought was more Roman. They wanted to improve Latin. Uh, and in terms of all sorts of artistic creativity, they, they came up with new things, but also they wanted to pick up on some old things, and so on. So this is quite a big question, so I don't want to get sidetracked into that now. But, uh, uh, something I wanted to briefly mention last week but didn't, but we'll, uh, we'll definitely pick up on that issue of what was the Renaissance and so on when we come to that later. Okay. All right. Can I just quickly ask one more thing? It's about these history. Um, why were, the, why were, these, were these people so interested in fitting themselves into the history? I mean, in the, into a certain historical understanding that shows a certain continuation. Well, they do a bit, yeah, well, there's, there's that kind of thing going on. We've got some interesting books in the library and articles that deal with some of these issues. As we said before, myth and origins and stories are, give you identity, okay? Where you come from, or where the way you think you come from, and the, how you describe your, your background as an individual, or as a group, or whatever, uh, feeds into uh, your identity now, okay? Your history affects or uh, reflects upon uh, your, what you think of yourself now. Now, these people were coming from outside the Roman world, and they were not denying that, but they were now part of, and they were largely in charge of the Roman world, and they fought themselves as becoming Roman, as being the heirs to uh, the Caesars and things like that. That's certain. We should look at that again on Friday. And so, they needed to, I think there was a sense that their identity had to shift a little bit. They had to emphasize certain things. And now that we're part of that world and the writers, I mean, Gregory of Tours and uh, Cassiodorus, these people were not Germanic or traditional sense, but uh, history, the, the situation of the Germanic people had changed and the situation in the Roman world had changed, so we had to kind of align these things up. Whereas before we had Tacitus last week just making these comments about the Germanic people over there, not even going to see them, just writing his little thoughts down, now they were here.
now things had changed, so they had to be incorporated and they figured in, both for themselves but also perhaps for their uh, uh, Roman subjects in a sense. Okay, last thing, and I see time has gone on very, very quickly, but a, a lot of what we can look at here is primarily to do with the big boys. It's the kings and the bishops and so on. A lot of medieval history focuses on that. A lot of what we're going to do in this course focuses on the big people. Um, but here we have a, a, a problem. We've talked about the Germanic world, uh, the barbarian kingdoms, as political change. We want to think what other changes happened. The Roman world, the map of the Roman world changed because uh, we now have uh, Clovis and Theodoric and uh, other people ruling uh, where once there had been one Roman emperor or something like that. But uh, in other respects, what about the ordinary Germanic peoples? What about the peoples who were underneath them or the ordinary Roman people? What was going on for them? How, do we, how can we perhaps find out what was going on on the ground? for kind of ordinary people rather than the big guys who are making the big religious and political changes. See that some of the issues we've talked about before, non-historical approaches may give us a different picture. In particular, something that we should look at this week and also next week with reference to the Anglo-Saxons, settlement. Okay? We call these things barbarian kingdoms partly because they're ruled by barbarians. Clovis was a Germanic Frank. Theodoric was an Ostrogothic uh, uh, ruler and so on. What about the lower levels of the kingdom? Were they also Germanic or were they something different? Now, I mentioned already the case of the Romance languages. What did that imply? What does this, what did I suggest that this implied about the Visigothic kingdom that has gone, or about the Frankish kingdom and so on. What does the uh, fact that they speak uh, Spanish and Catalan or French and, and uh, uh, Provencal or something there, what was, my, what was I implying by mentioning that fact? About ordinary people, not about the kings and so on. To some extent, they, they culturally identified themselves with the Romans. Right, okay, well, it, it was, I think, Edger mentioned a little bit about the influences, the lingu linguistic influences of Germanic. But if people speak uh, Romance languages in this area, Okay, in kingdoms that we're calling Germanic barbarian kingdoms, uh, we've kind of got, I suppose, two possibilities. Either lots of Germanic people came in and then they all stopped speaking uh, Frankish or Gothic and they started speaking some form of Latin, which then later on becomes Spanish and French and so on. Or else, not many Germanic people came in. There wasn't enough Germanic peasants following behind uh, Clovis and Theodoric and so on to actually uh, change the linguistic patterns of these areas. So the bosses and their uh, armies and, and so on, the guys who actually make the changes with the swords are Germanic, okay? But the actual people on the ground, the majority of people living in these kingdoms were still Roman in the sense that they were speaking uh, some form of, of Latin, okay? Except here, what we said, where we end up with all these Anglo-Saxons coming in, apparently, but we'll come back to that point later on. So that's one point. Um, and then we come back briefly with, 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 with three minutes or something, there's more things here, but names, again, that we talked about, okay? Another way of looking at uh, settlement is to look at names. Firstly, place names. People tend to come in, and there's two options here as well. Either we come in and say, okay, we're taking over your village now. Go away. What's your village called? And you say, well, it's called Ankara. So fair enough. Okay, now we're the bosses. We live in Ankara, and we're bringing this in. Or else we come in and say, oh, you're here, so we'll build somewhere new here. And we'll call it, and we'll give it a name in our language. Okay, so we either get assimilated onomastically and take over politically or whatever it is in your village, or else we come along and build our own settlements and give them our own names. Um, 
So we could study the names, and we'll certainly do that with the Anglo-Saxons. We could see, and we don't to a large extent find kind of, particularly down here or whatever, we don't find kind of thousands of Germanic place names in uh, France, southern France, or in, in Spain and Italy, okay? Most of the names are uh, uh, derived from uh, Latin elements and things like that. Sometimes we might have a Germanic personal name combined with a Latin suffix, such as in French, lots of places called ville. So we've got the ville of a Germanic guy and things like that. But the further south we go, those kind of things disappear as well. Okay. If we look at archaeology, and just very earnest, oh, is not a very good map for that. Archaeology as well. Graves, as we did last week with that uh, uh, guy, we looked at his grave somewhere on the other side of the Rhine. Okay. In France, for example, up kind of there, we've, we find some kind of graves that we can identify possibly as uh, as Germanic in style, uh, grave goods, for example. Um, but again, uh, we have to ask the question, like we saw last time, are people adapting to uh, Roman style? Are they bringing, or are the Romans adapting to their style? And a few further south. But language, uh, names, which is part of language, and archaeology, to a large extent, suggests that we didn't have huge numbers of Germanic peoples coming in and populating these kingdoms. It was the uh, political leaders and the military elite which was basically creating these new kingdoms. Below them, people continued uh, to be uh, speakers of Latin and to be Christian and to do the things that their ancestors had done a couple of hundred years before, except maybe a different situation in Britain, as we shall see next week. Okay? So, finally, finish off. Last thing. Barbarian kingdom, difficult concept. Barbarian in the sense of ruled by someone whose ancestors we could call Germanic barbarians or whatever. He himself didn't see himself quite like that. He was trying to fit into the Roman world, and we shall look at two examples of that on Friday with our reading. Okay? And even the very populations of these kingdoms were, uh, to a large extent, uh, direct continu continuations of the previous populations, living and working the land as their ancestors had done before them as part of the Roman world. So what exactly is the barbarian side? Well, we'll have a look on Friday, see what we can learn about the Ostrogoths and the Franks especially. Okay, thank you very much. It's been very, very hot in here, hasn't it? We've had all the windows closed, and I think last week everyone was complaining it was too cold. Look, Emma is thinking, oh, you can't please them, can you? I became aware of getting sweatier and sweatier as we went along. But uh, if the weather's a bit nicer on um, Friday, we can maybe open a window or two or something like that. Okay. Um,